I was 32 years old. I thought, what am I doing here? Listen, they're going to find out after a couple of days that I'm just, I'm just not that good. ACDC's Back in Black produced one of the most recognisable guitar riffs in rock music history. And the album of the same name went on to become one of the best-selling records ever released. But the song's origins are quite tragic. So what's the full story? And if you love delving into music history like I do, make sure to subscribe to the channel and join the pack. The song would never have come into existence without the sad death of Bon Scott. Scott passed away on February 19th, 1980 in London, with the official coroner's report citing acute alcohol poisoning as the cause of death. The singer and songwriter had joined ACDC in 1974, after the band's original lead vocalist, Dave Evans, began to drift in a different direction. Scott would go on to create and perform with ACDC from 1974 until his untimely death. His final public appearance with the band was recorded on Spanish TV, where ACDC performed Highway to Hell just 10 days before his tragic death by misadventure, as they put it. Following Scott's death, Brian Johnson, a founding member of the rock band Geordie, became ACDC's third lead singer. In March 1980, Brian Johnson received a phone call that would change his life forever. As a new decade began, he had little reason for optimism. At 32, he felt washed up. He was recently separated from his wife, and he was living in his parents' house in Gateshead, running a small car repair business and struggling to make ends meet. His days as a rock and roll star seemed pretty far behind him. In the early 70s, Johnson had already had a taste of the rock star dream, as the lead singer of the glam rock band Geordie. Geordie had enjoyed some success signing with EMI and scoring a top 10 UK hit in 1973 with All Because of You. However, Geordie never quite broke into the big leagues. As the hits dwindled, they eventually lost their record deal and they ultimately disbanded. When I left Geordie, Johnson recalls, I was completely broke. I had nothing. I had two kids and a mortgage to pay. I was driving a 14-year-old VW Beetle. I was skint. In the late 70s, Johnson managed to scrape enough money together to start his own business, focusing on repairs for luxury cars. This venture barely covered his expenses and was partly a labour of love, as he had been nuts about cars since childhood. He was also earning a bit of extra cash on the side, just enough for beer, with a new incarnation of his old band. This time, however, there was no illusions of grandeur. Brian knew there wasn't really any second chances in rock and roll, so he was using this band as just an outlet for fun. We did a lot of comedy because the boys were very funny, but they could rock out as well, he said. One song in particular was guaranteed to get the audience on their feet. It was a cover of an ACDC track. I didn't know too much about ACDC, Johnson admitted. They were this cult band, but everyone was talking about them. Everyone. We used to play Whole Lotta Rosie, and we always saved it for last because the crowd would go wild. Then came the phone call that would change everything. A woman in a German accent informed Brian that a band were looking for a new singer, and that he had been recommended. Auditions were taking place in London. Brian asked for the name of the band, but the woman on the phone was unwilling to give it away. Instead, she said she could give him the initials of the band. So of course she said... A. C. D. C. Which obviously immediately blew the cover, and Brian Johnson was happy to travel down to London to audition. Now, at Bond's funeral in February 1980, the band got together and decided on their future. Bond's father, Chick, pulled Malcolm aside and gave him blessing to continue the band without his son. This provided the boost they needed. Bond would have done the same, Angus Young said. We felt we had his blessing too. After the funeral, Angus, Malcolm, Cliff Williams and Phil Rudd returned to London. For a couple of weeks, they remained in mourning. We were still feeling really low, Malcolm admitted. We weren't snapping out of it. Then, at Malcolm's urging, he and Angus began writing again. It was just the two of us, Malcolm recalled. We picked up the guitars just for therapy. Maybe that's how we could get through this. At the very least, they wanted to complete what they had started with Bon. A few new songs had been written just before Bon's death. One was based on a stop-start riff that Malcolm had come up with during a sound check on their last tour. 
The other was recorded as a rough take with Bon on the drums, though he hadn't finished any of the lyrics. Once these new songs had started taking shape in mid-March of 1980, they decided that they should look for a new singer. However, as Angus noted, the mood within the ACDC camp began to shift. With strong new material written and auditions underway, the band was focused on moving forward rather than looking back. We'll certainly do our best to put out a great album, Angus said. If someone walked in tomorrow and clicked, we'd go straight in and record it. Because we've basically got all the ideas and songs, it just needs that one missing ingredient. And unbeknownst to him, Brian Johnson was always the favourite for the part. My name was at the top of the list, but they just couldn't find me, he explains. I'd fallen off the end of the world. Nobody knew where I was. It was Bon himself who had first mentioned Brian to the other members of ACDC after seeing a Geordie gig in the northeast of England. He later told Angus that the singer from Geordie had delivered the best Little Richard impersonation he'd ever seen, rolling around on stage and screaming his head off. It was rare for Bon to rave about anything, Angus recalled. It turns out, though, this Little Richard impression was actually Brian experiencing appendicitis. An ambulance soon rushed to the gig and took Brian away to hospital. Now, following Bond's death in 1980, a fan of ACDC got in touch to tell them about Brian Johnson. This fan sent a Geordie album to the band, along with a letter saying you've got to listen to this guy. Additionally, Brian later learned that Robert John Mutt Lang, the producer of Highway to Hell, was also aware of him. Mutt had told the guys, listen, there's one guy you should really listen to. I think it was Malcolm who said, that's the second time his name has come up, Brian said. After two auditions in London, the decision was made. Brian Johnson received that life-changing phone call from Malcolm Young. It was Brian's father's birthday. And after a game of pool at the local Crown pub, he returned home to an empty house where he received the phone call. When Malcolm called, he said, we've got an album to do and we need to leave in a couple of weeks. So if you're ready for it, Brian asked if that meant he got the job and Malcolm confirmed it. After hanging up, Brian apparently celebrated by taking a big swig from the whiskey that he bought his dad for his birthday. On April 1st, 1980, just six weeks after Bon Scott's death, ACDC announced Brian as their new singer. Excited by the news, Brian tried to tell his younger brother, who just thought it was an April Fool's joke. Not the best day to announce that news, I suppose. In London, the revamped ACDC quickly set to work on their new album. Brian Johnson recalls, When I joined, the guys had some song titles, but no lyrics. He wrote a few lyrics, but it was all a blur, as they asked him to give it a try. By late April, with nine tracks completed, the band and producer travelled to Compass Point Studios, the Bahamas, to record. Engineer Tony Platt said that the remote location helped to unite the group. And the first song to be recorded was Back in Black. Built from a funky riff that Malcolm had developed during the Highway to Hell tour, its lyrics celebrated invincibility and honoured Bon Scott. Malcolm said Back in Black was about remembering the good times with Bon. Johnson, who also contributed as songwriter, found recording this song a challenge. I remember Back in Black was particularly difficult because the boys were saying, listen, we want this song in memory of Bon, but we don't want it to be sad or maudlin. We want it to be a positive, uplifting song, Johnson said in an interview with NME. It was tough, but I think we pulled it off. It's kind of slow, but it's got a great riff. That one was a challenge. Johnson further explained, the guys wanted it to be a solid rock record in memory of Bon without all the sentimentality. They wanted the album to be black, and I added lines like, Nine Lives, Cat's Eyes, because Bon had lived on the edge for so long and always managed to pull through. And I really think Back in Black succeeds in paying homage to Bon Scott without being overly sentimental. Have a look at the lyrics. Yes, I'm let loose from the noose that's kept me hanging about. I've been looking at the sky because it's getting me high. Forget the hearse because I never die. The song honours Scott's spirit, celebrating his rebellious attitude while ensuring that the tribute stayed true to the band's rock roots. If the essence of Back in Black lies in the band's refusal to embrace the darker aspects of death, the song's central metaphor of being in black presents an interesting contrast. Despite the celebratory vibe of the song, it's clear that the band was still grieving the death of Bon. Angus Young later said that losing him was like losing a family member. 
While Johnson sings about being loose from the noose and urges everyone to forget the hearse, the reality of Scott's death remains. Although the band may have appeared to laugh in the face of death through the song, recording it just months after the tragedy was still an emotionally raw experience. So yes, the song exhibits this carefree attitude, but the title itself is a reminder of Bon Scott's passing. Because of course, what colour do you wear at a funeral? The Young Brothers intentionally chose Back in Black as the title track for the album even before it was fully finished. They wanted the album to be black, Johnson explained. While they deeply missed Scott, they felt it was their duty to send him off with explosive guitar riffs and powerful vocals that only they could deliver. Now, another monumental song in rock and roll history is the incredible Gimme Shelter by the Rolling Stones, but that too is steeped in tragedy. Click over here for the full story on that. <laughs> 